mit dran. Da ist nichts. Hello and thanks to everyone listening to this live stream, streaming live from Imatra in Eastern Finland. It's a real privilege and joy to be here today to open up some research perspe perspectives, help elucidate why saving this building matters so much and why we simply can't afford to let it fall into disrepair. In essence, this talk of mine could actually comprise just a single slide. The question is, why should we save the Church of the Three Crosses? Fittingly, for the theme of three, there are three primary reasons that one can summarize the case in. First off, the building is incontrovertibly deemed a masterpiece of modern architecture by a global audience. It serves as an emblem of Imatra, both locally and widely in the world, alongside other regional highlights, such as the famed River Rapids, the famed National Romantic Hotel, and other architectural and natural gems. In short, the building is a constituent element of what Imatra is and feels like and what it's known for. It's a beacon of local identity. Of course, an architectural masterpiece of this stature is always a travel destination as well. Architectural pilgrims flock to these sites out of deep respect, not least because buildings cannot really be meaningfully experienced anywhere else except in situ. Second, caring for the built environment is always a strong cultural contribution, whether the site in question is a medieval cathedral or a modern church. To commit to respecting, upholding, and caring for architectural heritage is a deeply meaningful endeavor societally, politically, and culturally speaking. We have an ethical mandate to look after our context and the historical layers of meaning that it comprises. This is one way of understanding ourselves. Third, evidence produced by contemporary science and policy making tells us that taking care of the built environment is taking care of the natural environment. The construction industry and architecture as a discipline more widely are moving increasingly away from new build as the basic paradigm and instead towards conservation, protection, repair, adaptive reuse and upcycling as new modes of design production. We now understand just how consumptive and extractive new build designs can be. And it's this recognition that compels us to try and focus on what we have instead. So these, I'd say, are the primary reasons. If we still had to distill a very, very rich list of arguments into a few main points. But I want to now spend some time outlining each one of the three in a little more detail. First off is the status of this building as a beacon of local identity, a globally renowned masterpiece of Finnish and European modern architecture, and also as a valued site of architectural tourism. When we address the question of why saving the Church of the Three Crosses really matters, in fact, we probably only really need to cite one reason, which is that the church is one of 13 sites included in the UNESCO World Heritage nomination list for all those modern architecture. The Three Crosses is the only standalone religious commission among the 13. I will note that the Cross of the Plains, which is another church of Altos in Seinoki, is part of the broader Seinoki Civic Center, so it's also included in the list. But again, the Three Crosses is the only standalone church. In other words, the Church of the Three Crosses has been judged as one of the 13 most significant buildings in the Altos entire portfolio. And it's worth pointing out that this list has been in the making for several years by expert panels. It's a very strict set of criteria that's being used. This isn't about individual personal tastes. There's strong scholarly consensus that these buildings are the ones that truly matter. Now, because Alvaralto is typically counted among the so-called big five of modern architecture, we can logically deduce that the three crosses must be one of the most significant buildings in the world. Simply put, it's one of the best buildings designed by the best architects of all time. It's sometimes tricky for us Finns to fully recognize just how appreciated and admired Alda is abroad, 
His international fame eclipses his reputation in his homeland, for sure. He's typically counted as just as significant, if not more significant, a Finn than Jean Sibelius. So you'd be entirely justified in thinking that his designs are worth protecting for this reason alone. In addition to the UNESCO World Heritage nomination list, the Church of the Three Crosses has been deemed a jewel by various other instances and institutions as well. Among them are the International Committee for the Documentation and Conservation of Buildings, Sites, and Neighborhoods of the Modern Movement, more familiarly known as Doko Momo, which considers the Three Crosses one of the highlights of Finnish modern architecture. So this is another set of architectural experts that have concluded that this building has outstanding heritage value. Similarly, the Three Crosses is also included in the Alvaralda Cultural Route, which is certified by the Council of Europe. It happens to be the first cultural route formally accepted by the Council from Finland. If not even potential UNESCO World Heritage status nor official recognition by the Council of Europe are sufficient to convince you that this building is worthwhile, let me appeal instead to a requisite degree of caution that one must exercise when dealing with built heritage. Here in Finland, the raising of wooden housing blocks, which happened en masse in the 1960s, serves as a cautionary tale. We now widely mourn the fate of 18th and 19th century wooden architecture, which in the mid-20th century was seen as hopelessly out of date and certainly not worth protection. In our time, we tend to look at the architecture of the 50s, 60s, and 70s with the same disparaging eyes. We don't value the architecture of the mid-century too highly, and we sometimes struggle to contain the urge to get rid of it, just like the minds of the 1960s couldn't help but choose to remove the layers of history that irk them. The Finnish Cultural Foundation is actually funding a research project currently titled The Value of the Modern, which addresses precisely this problem. The tendency to disparage recent history while valuing an older one has been diagnosed by scholars and commentators as near historical blindness. We don't seem to be able to appreciate the value of that which has come immediately before us. It seems a persistent rebellious streak in us, despite the fact that we otherwise might value much older eras and periods. Some artistic and cultural historians have used diagrams like the one we see here to explain how ch tastes change and oscillate in time, with oppositional forces alternating in historic sign pattern. Be it fashion, baby names, or architectural styles, it's a template of rejection and reacceptance that seems to define how our tastes develop. One period, for instance, might value romanticism and ornamentation, while the next fights back against it, replacing it instead with an ideal of minimalism and abstraction. Then the pendulum swings straight back again, the moment we've had too much of simplicity, and so on and so forth. With reference to this idea, it would be wise of us to recognize that similarly, our appreciation of the three crosses, and indeed of all those modern architecture more generally, is inevitably tainted by its relative nearness to us in time. We simply haven't had enough time to understand it fully just yet. And it's possible that many of the facets don't particularly speak us to it just yet, but might stand out as hugely valuable in a later period. So let's make sure that the next generations of architectural enthusiasts don't look down on our time, the 2020s, with scorn, cursing our myopia and selfish selfishness, and letting a masterpiece crumble to ruins in front of our own eyes. The third reason, ecological responsibility in an age of global climate crisis, in fact supports the previous point. A commitment to refraining from demolition too soon and an ambition to take care of buildings well enough to hand them over to subsequent generations is valuable, not just from an art historical and a cultural point of view, but also in light of sustainability. Be it cultural heritage or ecology that fuels us, we are increasingly convinced that protecting a building and ensuring its longevity are always better options than neglecting, let alone demolishing them. We recognize now that the most ecological building is in fact one that serves as many generations as possible. That is, it honors the materials and energy invested into its construction by serving its purpose far into the future. Our mindset is now shifting from hoping that high-tech buildings of the future will become our ecological saviors to appreciating that perhaps what we already have is what we need to care about. 
To give a very classic example, stone-walled medieval buildings are now heralded as proto-sustainable buildings. Although their construction swallowed up vast amounts of energy and materials, and although they certainly demand much more heating input than newer buildings do to reach a contemporary standard of livability, when their energy footprint is considered in relation to their lifespan, they come out rather favorably. In the hundreds of years since their completion, they have, in a sense, atoned for the huge effort that went into their construction. We should allow modern buildings to do the same. Let's let them grow into old age and serve people decades, if not centuries, into the future. The ecological mindset is becoming the primary, not the auxiliary framework of building conservation in our time. Whereas protective measures such as listing or conservation have typically been reserved for a few standouts deemed historically valuable enough, conservation experts are now increasingly calling for protection as the basic assumption for all buildings, irrespective of their perceived historical value. In other words, the ambition is for demolition to become as rare an instance as possible, rather than a standard path for a building only a few decades old. These three reasons alone, I hope, make it clear why saving the Church of the Three Crosses really matters, why protecting it for future generations is worthwhile. These three reasons essentially point to what we can gain or what we can be rewarded with if we commit to saving it. We gain more fame, reputation, recognition, more visitors and tourists to Imatra. We strengthen the global impression and admiration of Finnish architecture we contribute to local identity construction by taking care of one of its most famous symbols. We grow the region's attractiveness economically and otherwise. We make good headway in working towards our sustainability goals and so on. But additionally, we might ask in reverse, what is it that we stand to lose if we lose the Church of the Three Crosses? What is it that's left unaddressed, unresearched, unknown, and unvalued if we don't have the building in its rightful place in the future? What do we risk losing if we don't act now? If we lose the Church of the Three Crosses, we lose an important Finnish voice in the story of modern ecclesiastical architecture. In architectural history, in theory, uh, buildings are sometimes personified, so they're addressed as beings that speak to us and that narrate history to us by telling where they stand in the relevant debates and issues of their time. When it comes to the story of 20th century church architecture, the Three Crosses is no doubt the most famous Finnish voice of its time. It's mentioned in all the classic books on the history of modern architecture, and it's become such a classic itself that it's in fact difficult to find a seminal title that wouldn't mention it in some way or the other. Now, the building status in architectural history books might lead some commentators to shrug and say, okay, but then we probably don't need to save the building, right? After all, it'll live on eternally in photographs and texts. So why on earth do we have to spend so much effort into keeping it alive as a tangible site. While it's true that even if the building were to perish, it would of course persist in images and words all the same, but its demise would certainly kill off any future research and thus open up the process of it slowly fading outside of historical narratives that are currently being developed. It's all too easy to forget that modern architecture is still relatively young. We simply haven't had enough time yet to go through all the relevant research questions that exist. Research is flourishing today and will only continue to expand and deepen in the future. We must ensure the Three Crosses maintains its deserved position in current and future histories as well, and that these historical narratives are not skewed by its absence, which would be the result of our failure to protect it. Let me illustrate the historical and historiographical importance of the Three Crosses with reference to some of the project with, wi with which it engaged in direct dialogue. The design of the Three Crosses began in the same year that Notre Dame du Haut en Ronchamp was completed in France. Notre Dame du Haut is perhaps the most famous church of the 20th century, designed by none other than the Grand Master Le Corbusier. Because Alta's design in Imatra is also a sculptural white concrete mass, it's been considered Alta's antiphonal response to Le Corbusier, as though the two were in dialogue via their designs. If we lose the Church of the Three Crosses, we lose half of this dialogue. The Three Crosses also engages in dialogue with many other contemporaries. 
we can make a reference to the works of Mies van der Rohe, Walter Popius, Auguste Barret, and many others, and start to appreciate the complexity of the debates in which the church contributes through its architecture. A good example from our neighboring country is the sacral architecture of Sigurd Lievrens, whose designs are often analyzed in relation to those of Aldos. The former approach the mystery of sacred space through shadow, dimness, and material roughness, whereas the latter opted for the apparent diametrical opposite, totalizing whiteness, lightness, and smoothness. We need the three crosses and its place to continue research into these themes. The loss of the three crosses would thus represent a tremendous loss to the study of modern architecture internationally. But it would, of course, also be a huge loss more locally here in Finland in the story of the development of Finnish modern architecture. If we lose the three crosses, we lose a significant pivot project of Finnish ecclesiastical modernism. As soon as it was conse consecrated and opened to the public in 1958, the building was received both in Finland and abroad as a singular achievement. It was remarkably different from anything that had come before, both in Aldo's own portfolio and in Finnish church building more generally. It therefore became known as a watershed project that concluded an era of reserved conventionalism and ushered in a new period of structurally and spatially stirring expressionism in Finnish architecture. So the Three Crosses is a boundary project that, m that marks an era before and after, you might say. We have many examples of the before left in Finland in very good condition, and so too we have a notable corpus of the after, these so-called freeform churches that followed in the second half of the 20th century. The younger ones in particular are in much better condition because they have not aged dramatically just yet. The three crosses is the pivot, it's the hinge in between. It embodies the transition from one period to the other, and thus provides us with invaluable insight into the development of sacral architecture in the course of the 20th century. Of course, complementing its significance as a vessel of national historic importance is also the Three Crosses' relevance in a more local historical context. If we lose the Three Crosses, we lose a strand of Imatra's Karelian heritage. Why? This is because the Church of the Three Crosses makes direct reference to the lost province of Karelia, to which many Imatra locals had and still have personal connections today. Forest metaphors are so common in Aldo's work that they're sometimes considered a trademark gesture of sorts, perhaps the most famous example being the La Maira, where the delicate interior columns create a density that recalls the sensation of being surrounded by tree trunks in the forest. In Imatra, the church sits on a forested plot and is embraced by the leafy foliage that surrounds it. But here in Imatra, the forest was more than just a personal design motif of Aldo's. In this context, the forest was also a metaphor for Karelia as a lost sacred woodland. Karelia was an area ceded to the Soviet Union during the Second World War. In the post-war period, the rich suite of memories and myths that were attached to the Karelian woodlands by Finnish people were more laden than ever before with patriotic meaning. Karelia was particularly significant in Imatra, both because of its proximity to the border and because of the several thousands of Karelian evacuees who were settled in Imatra. Local parish officials longingly cast Imatra as an allusion to the paradise of Karelia. Imatra could never substitute the real Karelia, of course, but just as worldly life sometimes offers glimpses of heavenly paradise, similarly Imatra could reflect some of the glories of the now inaccessible paradisiacal province. Since Karelia was mythicized in the national imagination of the province of poetry and forests, emphasizing the forested surroundings of the new church became a leitmotif of Aldo's work in Imatra. Let's notice how important individual trees and the topography of the ground are in the site plan that we're looking at here. Both the forest town and to the Church of the Three Crosses as a forest church. And the term forest church was not just a term invented by local priests or by Aldo. In fact, it was a very real tradition of outdoor worship space that had existed for a long time. The conception of a forest church in a forest town was particularly pertinent since traditional forest churches were associated with Karelia more than any other Finnish province. These were low-walled, open-air clearings made in dense forests with rough-hewn pews and typically a wooden cross, a very simple wooden cross substituting a traditional painted altarpiece. 
The forested nature of the church plot brings us to another important theme, which is town planning and urbanism. If we lose the Church of the Three Crosses, we lose a valuable opportunity to better understand the complicated relationship between religion and urban planning. For centuries, Finnish and many European communities adhere to the church in the city center tradition. So in other words, the church and especially its bell tower were the focal points of the center of both rural and urban settlements. And this is a tradition that continued well into the 20th century. After the World Wars, many architects developed their views of the ideal city center. They typically set a range of civic, cultural, and commercial functions into very compact centers, including churches as well. Compared to many contemporaneous schemes, the Church of the Three Crosses appears unusually isolated. Out of all of all those churches, the Three Crosses is the only one to sit in a master plan also devised by Alba himself. And it's also the only church whose specific plot he was able to choose freely. The project therefore offers privileged insights into Aldo's understanding of the relationship between religion and urbanism. And what's relevant here is that the plot that he chose was surprisingly isolated. He did not choose to place the church in the city center that he himself also designed for Imatra, which we see in the miniature model here and which included a range of civic and cultural functions placed together in a dense ensemble. Alto's chosen plot instead was in an area reserved for industry rather than commercial or residential neighborhoods. The church sits here to the left in the site plan in an area that's subtitled Wood Processing Industry Center rather than the area labeled Town Center to the right. Alto's resistance to setting the church in the city center contrasts to what most of his peers would have done. And the gesture illustrates how Alto avoided subsuming sacred space in the same group as other cultural and commercial functions. For him, the sacred certainly belonged to the city and to human life, but it couldn't be easily conflated with any other public function, nor reduced to a mere visual landmark in the city center. The problem was that the church in the city center tradition no longer worked the way it had before. Prior to industrialization, a central plot bang in the middle of a settlement was an obvious choice to highlight the dominance of the church therein. But in the 20th century, there was a real risk of central plots doing the opposite and cheapening the church because of their increasingly commercial rather than civic nature. The connections between planning and religion are the subject of such great interest in our time that entire research units and groups have been founded in countries like Belgium, the United States, and Italy in the last decade or so. They're all trying to enrich our limited understanding of the relationship between ecclesiastical architecture and urbanism. The Church of the Three Crosses carries tremendous potential to influence this line of research precisely because its relationship to Aldo's master plan is so unusual. Another field of research in which the Three Crosses holds much potential to influence historical narratives is the study of building types. If we lose the Church of the Three Crosses, we lose a chance to develop our understanding of the emergence and evolution of new building types. It's actually very infrequently in the history of architecture that an entirely new category of building is born. Think of domestic houses, barns, temples, laundry rooms, or boat sheds. These are all examples of virtually timeless building types that have been needed since time immemorial and that will no doubt continue to be needed in the future. Their architectural composition, expression, their formal characteristics might change in time, but their purpose remains the same. Very rarely we witness the birth of entirely new types of buildings never needed before. A classic example is the emergence of the railway station in the 19th century, or to evoke a more recent example, supercomputing facilities and their cooling plants in our own time. One of the new building types that decisively claimed its place in the canon of 20th century architecture was the parish center. After the World Wars, both Protestant and Catholic churches in Europe sought to affirm their presence in newly urbanized uh, neighborhoods. The horrors of the war had suggested that truth, meaning, and faith still had value in a modernized world, but the problem was that churches were too often seen as hierarchical, distant, <coughs> excuse me, and even cold institutions. Similarly, their architectures were seen as bombastic and even inappropriate given the austerity and hardships of the post-war era. So the solution became to build parish centers instead. These were very meek neighborhood buildings rather than monumental urban center pieces, just like the example we're looking at here. <coughs> it shows how humble and even shy, <coughs> excuse me, they typically were. <coughs> 
Architects, including Alvaraldo, expressed dismay at priests' unbridled enthusiasm for building parish centers in lieu of churches. They argued that the dignity of real churches was still needed in modern times, and that a sense of hierarchy was actually a virtue. The priest's counter-argument was that the only architectural way for the church to communicate its ambition to meet people in their everyday lives was to build more humbly. <coughs> Alto's preference was not to have a parish center at all, but in cases where the client or the competition program demanded one, he submitted himself to the task, albeit begrudgingly. And this is exactly what happened here in Imatra, where parish priests requested a parish center with ample spaces for teaching and socializing. Aldo opted for the rather diplomatic and subversive method of seemingly agreeing to the parish's wishes, but made sure to design a plan that actually proved the superiority of the traditional church above the parish center. He refused to blend in social and sacral spaces into a singular mass. And what he did instead was added a supplementary volume to the nave in which he placed the social spaces that the parish had requested. What we're looking at here is the initial plan, the ground floor plan for the church, which is already distinctly recognizable thanks to the three curved bulging walls that even today give the space its rhythm. And this is where Alta sets the functions that the parish required, which would have been very typical for a parish center, a club space, dining hall, storage, and teaching rooms. Crucially, the block was nestled on the church's western facade and only offered transverse access rather than longitudinal access to the nave proper. Parish priests were, of course, very disappointed when Alta presented them with this scheme. The design was rather grandiose. It was hardly humble in the manner that they hoped for, and sacred and social spaces were not blended into one, but remained distinctly separate. Alda managed to convince the priests of the design's virtues by very cleverly exploiting the biblical metaphor of a heavenly forecourt to justify it. The block in front, he explained, was a heavenly forecourt that served the main temple beyond. So if we lose the Church of the Three Crosses, we lose a fascinating example that promises to complement and challenge our perception of how new building types are born and how they develop. When it comes to parish centers, the standard narrative is typically that parish centers took over churches. They virtually substituted the old template of a hierarchical sacral church. The Three Crosses is an interestingly ambiguous example in which the church building appears to swallow up the parish center. So it's a bit of both at the same time. For this reason, its spatial syntax and floor plan are so idiosyncratic. But the most idiosyncratic aspect of the design is its three-dimensional composition, so the walls, ceilings, roofs, columns, and vaults. And this observation brings us to another point. If we lose the Church of the Three Crosses, we lose a masterpiece of architectural geometry. Since its inception, the Three Crosses has been hailed as the ultimate proof of Aldo's imperiled ability to translate a two-dimensional floor plan into a totalizing three-dimensional sense of plasticity. Both then and now, the building's been counted among the most impressive and elusive geometric achievements in modern architecture. It's only half-jokingly been deemed the climax of the Finnish Baroque. The plastic geometry of the nave is so complex that it's not entirely clear even this day how its forms were calculated and achieved. And of course this achievement is all the more impressive given that the design predates the computerized design technologies and softwares that are available to designers today. Neuroscience has increasingly engaged with architecture in recent years. Much research is being undertaken into the effects that forms, shapes, spaces, light, shadow, and texture have on the human mind. The Three Crosses remains a special point of interest among scholars internationally. How do these spectacular vaulted ceilings affect one's perception and experience of this special space? How does this geometric masterpiece imprint a powerful spatial embodiment on the human brain? So we all know that to achieve these complex forms, architectural design involves a lot of drawing, calculating, and modeling. But it's easy to forget that sometimes talking can be, can be a potent tool as well. We mentioned before how various architects impacted one another through their church designs um, and how their dialogues are sometimes imprinted in the buildings themselves. It's often assumed that modernists only conversed among themselves. So they considered themselves the unchallenged authorities in the design field and therefore chose to design their buildings in a vacuum, unaffected by anyone else um, outside the architectural sphere. 
but the Church of the Three Crosses suggests otherwise. If we lose the Church of the Three Crosses, we lose a rare opportunity to understand how dialogue between church officials and architects impacted church designs directly. Aldo received support for his de design of the Church of the Three Crosses from a rather surprising source, two bishops of the National Church. The fact that local priests, industrialists, and municipal councillors involved themselves in the building of the Three Crosses was entirely typical in 20th century Finland. But what was highly unusual was the involvement of more senior members of the clergy. Because parish churches were built by local parishes, the involvement of figures from the higher echelons of the national church was truly exceptional. The first bishop with whom Aldo shared affini affinities was Bishop A. Nosormone, sometimes called the Bishop of Culture in recognition of his contributions to Finnish artistic and cultural discourse. Sormonen and Aldo were in correspondence since the 1920s, and there's a mutually supportive tone in their exchange, which reveals a shared concern for the due valorization of the sacred in modern religious architecture. Aldo would have certainly felt supported by Sormonen's views when justifying his insistence on building what he called a real church rather than a parish center in Imatra. And furthermore, Sormonen's critiques of commercialization and technology, as well as his appreciation of classical antiquity and Christianity as the jewel foundations of Western culture, resonated deeply with Aldo's personal thought. The other bishop whose support Aldo had was Bishop Marti Simojoki, who eventually became archbishop. In his memoir, Simojoki wrote that during his decades-long career, there had only been one case in which an architect had initiated a conversation on church building. This was Alvar Aldo when he designed the Church of the Three Crosses in Imatra. It would be a mistake to regard the conversations that Aldo had with these bishops as irrelevant background information. From an architectural historical perspective, these dialogues are tremendously interesting. It's because they challenge existing assumptions of modernists approaching sacral commissions purely opportunistically to further their own artistic or commercial ends without any kind of engagement with religious themes, issues, or individuals. The ways in which Aldo engaged with the bishop are reflected in the Church of the Three Crosses, and they demonstrate a case in which modern architecture is in fact the fruit of religious dialogue. Further research would no doubt corroborate this conclusion further. One might of course ask how on earth are these dialogues materialized in the architecture itself? Are these ideas legible in the design today? For Bishop Simoyoki, the titular three crosses at the altar were the most important materialization of the fundamental theme of the building. He analyzed the altar as follows, and this is a direct quote from his sermon. A single cross, the middle one, of course already testifies to God's love for the world. But the two crosses that stand beside it at Golgotha communicate this. Christ belongs to all people, to those who repent and to those who don't and to those who respect the sacred, as well as to those for whom nothing is sacred. In other words, in Simoyoki's understanding, there was a remarkable tolerance in Christian dogma. Both the righteous and the sinful can be saved. Therefore, the national church as an institution should not seek to divide people into those who are right and who are wrong, but like Christ, should welcome everyone. The altar may have been the clearest explanation of this theme, of open-mindedness, essentially, um, and of it being translated into physical form. But the bishop also saw manifestations of this idea elsewhere in the architecture as well, especially the ceiling, the windows, and the walls. For him, the entire building was a critical commentary on dogmatism and the need for open-mindedness. The building's architecture seemed to question the necessity or even existence of strict divisions between inside and outside, the straight line and the curve, light and shadow. In complicating the relationship between these types of typical architectural opposites, he suggested that the three crosses evaded perspicuity and accepted perplexity, just as the national church ought to. What's fascinating about the bishop's theological interpretation is that it picks up on the central thesis of various architectural analyses made of the three crosses. The conclu key conclusion of most architectural critics has been that the building appears to resist strict dualisms. It's the three crosses eastern wall, which we see here in this section in particular, that seem to crystallize the building's ambiguous relationship to architectural pairings, such as inside and outside, or surface and structure. Aldo's design does not define a strict boundary between inside and outside, but instead it gives us a nebulous in-between space that is neither nor. 
Neither does it make clear what is structure and what is surface, but it blends them together into luringly poetic walls that bend almost like fabric. So in the architecture of the three crosses, Alta highlighted parallels between the modern architectural project and Christianity. In religion, as in modern architecture, tolerance bore more fruit than dogmatism. The bishop's appeals for broadening the reach of the church matched all those calls for modernism be to become more willing to deviate from its self-defined orthodoxy. This thematic overlap crystallizes the Church of the Three Crosses' essence as a modern religious building. It challenges rigid doctrinarism in both religion and architectural modernism. Both the bishop and the architect underscored that the heart rather than the head was a necessary instrument to live a modern life. The little man ought to rely on empathy, wisdom, patience, and criticality to avoid the pitfalls of judgmental self-importance. So, in raising money to save the three crosses, we're not just raising money to save a wonderfully sculptural piece of modern architecture. Neither are we raising money purely for the furthering of scholarly research, not even for the protection of a much-loved local icon or as a way to attract more visitors to come see it. We're in fact raising money to save a building that reminds us of the virtues of open-mindedness and grace. The Three Crosses reminds us that often goodness, beauty, and faith can be found somewhere in the nebulous space between rigid extremes. It tells us that sometimes humaneness is more valuable than strict orthodoxy. The world and life within it are rarely black and white, but usually they're colored in the kaleidoscopically complex shades that humanity brings upon them. Perhaps it's this lesson that's the most valuable aspect of the three crosses and the most poignant reason that we must take action now. So it's time for us to get excited, to activate, to mobilize, to energize, to save a masterpiece of Finnish, European, and global modern architecture. In all those own words, it's time to show the world that we care, to show them that we value the building as well as the ethical, religious, and theological statement that it makes. So let's blow them away. Thank you very much. <laughs>